we're grateful to, to uh, have representatives of the publisher uh, of this new edition of New Will Bring Her Saints, Slaves, and Blacks. The Changing Place of Black People Within Mormonism. Um, Greg Colford Books is the publisher, and we're grateful for all the efforts that they have made to make this book possible and to support this evening. Um, I'm trying to think, what is our next signing? Carrington, maybe? Yeah, we're still working on a date, but uh, we Definitely will be having a big affair uh, for the uh, Leonard Arrington Diaries, um, edited by Gary Vergera. Gary, I saw you earlier. Did, where are you? There you are. So we need to get that date set. But we're really excited. Um, those diaries are incredible, uh, voluminous. It'll be a three-volume set. <coughs> I believe it's $150 retail. Um, but it's going to be a, a magnificent contribution to Mormon studies. Um, some have already spent time with his diaries, and, and you know if you have that, that, that there's material there that you won't find anywhere else. Okay, um, so tonight I'm going to briefly introduce New Bringhurst and um, Graciously, uh, Ronald Coleman and Paul Reeve have agreed to uh, to participate tonight as well. And uh, after Newell, uh, Ron will take a few minutes, as will Paul. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's. I think I've covered covered most of that. So. Um, Ronald Coleman uh, is a professor of history, uh, University of Utah Emeritus, and uh, he appears, I was just trying to find some of the things in which he appears in print. Uh, one that we have for sale here is Black and Mormon uh, that Darren Smith and Newell Bringhurst edited. Uh, Ron has an important piece in there. Um, Paul Reeve is an author and historian that many of you are acquainted with. He's the Simmons Mormon Studies Professor in the History Department at University of Utah and is now the President-elect of the Mormon History Association. So when they have uh, the conference in 2019 here in Salt Lake, uh, he will be presiding uh, at that. And this year it's in Boise, Idaho, so if you, if you have a chance to go up for MHA, it's always uh, an incredible experience. Um, of course, it's hard to keep all these books up here, sorry. Um, <clears throat> just to let you know, if you don't already know this book, Religion of a Different Color, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness. Um, of course, I think of the phrase growing up, a horse of a different color, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it has different content. Uh, I have read it actually, and it's a wonderful book. But uh, Paul, what what award did you won an award for this book? Did you not? Yes. Tell us what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so MHA Best Book Award, Sorry, John Whitmer Best Book Award, and uh, Utah State History Society Best Book Award. But other than that, did you win any awards? No. <laughs> <laughs> you might Don't want to repeat that. <laughs> Uh, uh, so you can really say an award-winning book on that. Um, so we're excited to have those two gentlemen with us tonight. And uh, the star of the show, Newell G. Bringhurst, uh, most of you know plenty about him. If you want to know some really good stuff, I'll tell you afterwards. Uh, he is Professor Emeritus of History and Political Science at the College of the Sequoias in Visalia, California. Uh, he's the author of many books. Uh, I just brought a couple up up here. Three volume set uh, of The Persistence of Polygamy, uh, one of the editors uh, of those three volumes. I believe we have all those in stock. He also did the um, biography of Fawn McKay Brody. Uh, 
I think she didn't she write the foreword to Bushman's uh, Rough Stone Roll? Um, by the way, her book No Man Knows My History, which we I just acquired a few copies uh, that are in new condition that we have on our sale table in case you're interested. But um, that book, No Man Knows My History, was published in 1945. For many years it was only available in hardback and then it finally came out in paperback and it has been continuously in print since 1945. That's mm. very unusual. Uh, is that going to be the case for Saints, Slaves, and Blacks? And will it be in print for 50 years? Or? I'll, okay. I'll be shocked. Uh, I won't be around to see it. Okay. Uh, he did a, a little biography of Brigham Young. Um, he's, he's done, uh, he edited many books, written numerous articles. Uh, he is past president of both uh, MHA and the John Whitmer Historical Association. Um, and he is uh, uh, an unquestioned authority on the, the topic of race in the Mormon Church, uh, as, well as, as well as other topics. Uh, but we're, we're excited to have him come uh, join us here at Benchmark Books. Uh, we were trying to remember how many times we've had Newell speak, and we think at least a half dozen, if not more. Uh, we're planning on more in the future, Newell. So, so uh, with that, I will now turn the time over to Newell Bringhurst, and then we'll hear from our other two uh, contributors to this evening. And uh, again, once again, we really appreciate... Oh, I did want to read one blurb. Sorry, I just thought of this. I knew I had my glasses up here for a reason. Um, and this seems a little bit incestuous because the blurb is from Paul Reeve. <laughs> but, but I think it sums up really well uh, this, this new edition. And by the way, Newell will tell you a little bit about the differences between the first edition, which we have in hardback. This is only paper. Uh, but... In, in, with regard to that, Paul Reeve wrote, In many regards, Bringhurst established the terms on which su subsequent scholars would engage race and Mormonism. Coford's reissue of Saints, Slaves, and Blacks is therefore a welcome re-addition to the flourishing of scholarship on a subject that Bringhurst helped to pioneer and then refused to abandon. Newell Bringhurst. I was going to put on my jacket after all, since these two gentlemen are coming, but, I, but it's a little bit late now. We'll, we'll go, go ahead. And, yeah, if you just, want to, I'll grab it for you. Oh, okay, go ahead. You want me to? Yeah, if yeah you're, I'll look a little bit stuff. If you're a glutton, sure. for, glutton for punishment, I'm going to be a mask. Stick this in your pocket right, right okay. there, I think. <laughs> and we'll stick this in there. Well, let's test it out and see. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Am I coming across? Okay, yes. good. I'll okay. Your okay, thanks. Uh, well, I guess I, I start with a comment and then I guess a rhetorical question. My comment is I have been waiting 37 years to be able to talk about saints, slaves, and blacks. And I'll try to explain maybe a little bit why that is the case. And I guess the <laughs> second comment is, uh, is a question, obviously, how does this book differ from the first uh, edition of Saints, Slaves, and Blacks that was published back in 1981? And uh, uh, I, I, I guess it, it differs in, in, in three basic ways. Uh, number one, the format of this new edition as reprinted uh, and republished by uh, Colford is a much cleaner, it's a much, uh, it, it's a much more attractive volume. For one thing, the, the thing I really appreciate about uh, Colford doing this is they put the footnotes at the bottom of each page. Whenever I read a book, given it scholarly or otherwise, I always appreciate the fact that the footnotes are at the bottom of the page, uh, whereas that was not the case for the first printing of saints, slaves, and blacks. So both in the way it's laid out and the format, it, it's different from the first edition, a very much more attractive book in every sense of the term. Uh, the second way in which it's different is I have written a new introduction where I extensively talk about 
how, uh, how I produced the book, what uh, the process that I went through, which uh, started out as a doctoral dissertation when I was at the University of California, Davis, which was completed in 75, and then the book was extensively revised because when it, when it w was finished as a dissertation, I, uh, it was before the, the ban on uh, black priesthood denial had been lifted. And I concluded at the end of my doctoral dissertation, very erroneously, that I didn't see that the ban would be lifted in the foreseeable future. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. And uh, so that necessitated uh, a, a major revision on the later chapters. In fact, I added two, three new chapters at the end, which made it significantly different from the doctoral dissertation. And uh, so, that's what I do in the introduction. I also, in the introduction, I, I, I uh, uh, not only talk about the process of my book, but I talk to some extent about the scholarship that has followed in the wake of my book, in which I acknowledge the excellent, fine scholarship by those scholars who uh, were as foolish as I was to continue to pursue the topic of race within Mormonism. I, I mentioned, for example, uh, the work of Jesse Embry, who did uh, a statistical, more current uh, study of, of, of blacks, a book that was published in the early 90s. I also uh, talk about uh, Armand Moss, who from a sociological perspective uh, looked at the issue of, of race in all of Abraham's children, another excellent study. And also Paul Reeve, who is here with me uh, tonight, his excellent uh, Race of a Different Color. Uh, which, uh, as I, uh, which has pointed out, has received numerous awards and the wide recognition that it justly deserves. And more recently, uh, a, a, a quite a provocative book, but a, a, a book that commands attention, uh, Max Mueller's Race and the Making of Mormon People, which just came out in 2017. And so, it, it, uh, anyway, that's what I do in the introduction. And then in the, um, uh, I also uh, included in the new edition a, uh, a, a reprint of an article that I did uh, for the 25th anniversary of the lifting of the priesthood ban, which was originally published in uh, Sunstone. And that's a more personal article in which I talk about why I came to the field of Mormon studies and the impact it's had on me, it had on my family, and, 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 and a little bit about the travials that I experienced in writing uh, slaves, saints, and blacks. The other way in which it differs is the, the, generous, uh, the generosity of, of three scholars who consented to write uh, uh, a foreword, Edward Bloom a professor of uh, religious studies down at San Diego State wrote a foreword. And then Paul Reeve wrote, uh, wrote a postscript, as did uh, Darren Smith, whom I partnered with in doing uh, uh, Black and Mormon, uh, the, the work in which Ron Coleman's uh, essay uh, appears. So those, so those are the significant differences. So, uh, and the other interesting thing is it actually is selling for a cheaper price than what my original uh, Saints, Slaves, and Blacks sold for. Uh, it, when, it, when it was priced back in 1901, it was priced as, an 80, as, as, a, as a $29 book. And at that time, $29 was considered sort of like a, like a $75 book would be today. It was outrageously uh, overpriced. And uh, it quickly went out of print, partly as a result of, of being outrageously overpriced and, and, and limited number of copies that were uh, in, in, in print. And so, uh, anyway, uh, those are the differences. I, I, I don't want to take, uh, over, take too much time, but uh, 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 Kurt uh, wanted me to maybe give you a little bit of a taste of what's in the book itself. And I... I, I, I thought I'd give to you a little bit of, uh, of uh, the kind of the interesting story of uh, how uh, the church reacted to the civil rights movement during, uh, the 19, uh, during the period from 1945 to 1970 and how that impinged or related 
to uh, the uh, doubling down on the whole thing with regard to black priesthood denial. Uh, I'm sure most of you in this room are familiar with the general history of the civil rights movement, uh, uh, a time when uh, most religious denominations uh, supported the quest for civil rights, particularly the black churches, you know, Martin Luther King, but so did, uh, and, 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 and the various black churches, but also various uh, non-black churches, uh, a lot of Protestant denominations, the Catholic Church, Jewish uh, uh, people within the Jewish community, they were actively uh, supportive of the black civil rights movement. In fact, speaking of the latter group, the Jewish uh, people, uh, two of the th uh, three civil rights uh, people killed in Mississippi in that horrible incident were, were, were of Jewish background. And so they were all very active in uh, the civil quest for black equality. But the, uh, the Latter-day Saint, the Mormon Church, tended to hold back. In fact, a number of LDS high church leaders actually spoke out against uh, uh, civil rights. For example, J. Reuben Clark, who was a member of the LDS First Presidency, warned that the struggle to break down all race prejudice would lead to racial intermarriage. Racial intermarriage was always the bugaboo. Uh, for Latter-day Saints. That was often thrown out as the canard to justify not supporting black civil rights or even opposing black civil rights. Uh, uh, Apostle Mark E. Peterson was even more emphatic. In a very highly controversial 1954 uh, address to BY, at BYU uh, entitled Race Problems as They Affect the Church, Peterson claimed the blacks were not simply seeking equal social and political rights, but sought complete absorption with the white race. And he went on even further and characterized this segregation as divinely sanctioned. He said, I think the Lord segregated the Negro, and who is the man to change that segregation? It reminds me of the scripture on marriage. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Only here, Peterson continued, we have the reverse of that. What God hath separated, let not man bring together again. Pretty strong words. Peterson's ad address was clearly a reaction to the United States Supreme Court historic decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, which mandated the desegregation of public schools. Then senior apostle Joseph Fielding Smith assailed what he called the wave of non-segregation, I like the way he put it, the wave of non-segregation sweeping the country. He echoed the fears of other church leaders that the uh, doctrine of social equality would eventually lead to racial intermarriage and, uh, and or amalgamation. Most significantly and most noteworthy was the position of then church president David O. McKay, who expressed similar fears concerning the civil rights movement. Uh, and this came at a time, kind of an interesting time for President McKay, uh, uh, when uh, McKay conceded that one of the church's most pressing problems was the church's relation with uh, black people which have clearly he was alluding here to the problems of uh, black priesthood denial. But he, uh, he opposed what he called legally enforced integration. In fact, he went even further, proclaiming that southern segregated blacks were better off than their counterparts in the integrated north. Uh, President McKay, moreover, gave tacit approval to ongoing segregation practices in Utah, most radically evident in the discriminatory policies imposed by, against blacks by the church-owned Hotel Utah, which is now the Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph Smith Memorial uh, build, building. It was one of the grandest hotels uh, at the time in, in, in Salt Lake City. Even more outspoken 
even more extreme as an outlander on the issue of of uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, civil rights was then Apostle Ezra Taft Benson, who eventually became church president. Benson claimed that the civil rights movement was part of a communist plot to subvert American freedom. Uh, Benson didn't express his views in private or semi-private thing, but he expressed it in church general conference in, on a number of occasions during the 1960s. Uh, for example, in, in a 1963 address, he uh, claimed that the civil rights movement had been fomented entirely by the communists. He uh, repeated his, uh, this stark claim uh, two years later in, uh, in a 1965 LDS conference address, saying that, quote, Communists were using the civil rights movement to promote revolution and the eventual takeover of the country. This was a time when we were right in deep in the Cold War with, with, the, with the Soviet Union, then Soviet Union. And then he went on, uh, he warned his uh, fellow uh, assembled Mormons gathered at the conference, when are we going to wake up? What do, what do you know about the dangerous civil rights agitation in Mississippi? Do you fear the destructions of all vestiges of state government? He then concluded, Brethren, if we had done our homework and were faithful and could step forward at, at, time, at this time and help save the country. Benson was clearly reacting against the recent enactment of civil rights, landmark civil rights legislation, specifically the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, barring discrimination in public accommodations, and uh, also against the 1965 uh, Voter Rights Act, guaranteeing black equal voting rights. And, uh, but Benson was also influenced by his close, almost intimate association with the uh, militantly anti-communist uh, group known as the John Birch Society. Uh, he looked upon uh, its founder and its uh, uh, director, uh, Welch, Robert Welch, as sort of a mentor. He, he had a very, very close personal relationship with, uh, with, with uh, Robert Welch. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, Benson's highly charged comments uh, brought unwanted national attention to the LDS Church and its increasingly controversial black priesthood uh, ban. Closer to home, Benson's speech also earned the ire of the Salt Lake City chapter of the NAACP, which called for a national resolution asking all developing nations to, quote, refuse to grant visas to LDS missionaries and other church officials until such time as the church's doctrine of non-white inferiority is changed and rescinded and a positive policy for civil rights taken. And uh, uh, so that was the position of the NAACP. I hasten to point out, however, that not all Latter-day Saints agreed with the anti-civil rights position of Ezra Taft Benson and others in the church hierarchy. Taking an opposing position in support of civil rights was an increasingly number of concerned uh, Latter-day Saints, many of them from the academic community. A notable example was Sterling M. McMurrin, who was a professor at the University of Utah and later became Commissioner of Education under John F. Kennedy. He was one of the voices that really spoke strongly against, uh, that pushed back against this anti-civil uh, rights uh, position uh, that was assumed by, uh, within the church hierarchy. Also uh, pushing back was, uh, was Stuart L. Udall, who was Secretary of Interior uh, under then-President John F. Kennedy and a lifelong Latter-day Saint. Uh, Udall, in fact, directly condemned uh, Benson's comments and uh, warned that they really reflected negatively upon the church. A, a, a third prominent Latter-day Saint to speak out was uh, a man whose last name you might have heard of. His name was George Romney. 
I'm sure you've heard the name Romney, uh, particularly recently. Uh, uh, Romney was, uh, was Michigan governor at the time and very prominent within uh, one of the leading figures within the Republican Party. He was, uh, he was touted throughout the 1960s as a probable presidential contender, as my friend Martin Brando would say. They felt that he was, uh, he was sure to run for president, and in fact, he did make a brief run for the presidency in 1968. So there were these other voices out there. Also bringing pressure upon the church was the NAACP, both alarmed and angry that Utah was the only western state that had not passed laws guaranteeing basic civil rights for minority groups. The NAACP, in fact, threatened to picket Temple Square at the upcoming October 1963 General Conference. Alarmed at this prospect, Hubie Brown and N. Eldon Tanner both counselors within the LDS First uh, Presidency met with Albert Fritz, who was a president of the Salt Lake chapter of the NAACP uh, in Salt Lake City. And Brown, I should mention, I have more to say about Hubie Brown, one of the more interesting uh, people within the church hierarchy. Uh, he was by far the most enlightened member of the church hierarchy on the issues of race and civil rights. As I say, I'll have more to say about him. But at this time, he promised the NAACP that a statement concerning the church's position with respect to the Negro would be made at the upcoming conference. Brown's efforts uh, to secure approval from fellow church leaders for such a statement proved challenging and daunting uh, because uh, he, had to, he had to secure at least the passive, passive approval if not, uh, you know, if not the outright uh, uh, quell the opposition, possible opposition from the hardliners uh, who were against uh, uh, racial equality, most especially Ezra Tapp Benson, Joseph Fielding Smith, and Harold B. Lee. Uh, 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 Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold B. Lee were the two more senior apostles at that time. When President McKay learned that the NAAC uh, would, uh, was talking about picketing the upcoming conference, he agreed to let Brown present a statement that he had drafted. He had the help of Sterling McMoran in drafting uh, uh, the statement that uh, McKay agreed, President McKay agreed could be read at the upcoming conference. But McKay specifically told Brown to present the document within the context of his own uh, longer conference address. Uh, uh, because he, he, he did this out of deference to uh, the hardliners uh, like Benson and, uh, and, uh, and, and the others. But uh, Brown ignored uh, McKay's advice. When he got up to present his statement, he read the civil rights statement, paused, and then before proceeding with his prepared talk. Thus, Brown created the impression that what he had just read was an official statement of policy, of church policy, from the first presidency. The statement itself was uh, in fact aimed at the slaveholders, atypical from chattel slavery laws passed in the American South, more typical of laws of gradual emancipation passed in the American North, uh, prescribing what they can and can't do with their black slaves, uh, requiring them to give them an education. Those are aspects of that territorial legislature uh, that were very distinct uh, from chattel slavery laws that governed uh, the lives of black slaves in the American South. Um, and Brinkhurst claims that the restrictive provisions of the law could not help but have dampened the effects, uh, have a dampening effect on slaveholding in Utah. So um, I like the way that he, as early as 1982, when he's uh, you know publishing this originally, thinking through that territorial legislative session, 
uh, we have an, uh, additional sources uh, from that legislative session that we'll be publishing, but um, Newell, without those additional sources, was arriving at these conclusions. And then the other thing um, he pays attention to uh, that early on was uh, the way that whiteness plays out in American history. Um, he recognizes it as something at play. Uh, obviously, in my book, I develop it as a full theme for the book, but if you read uh, Noel's book, pay attention because it's there uh, in, in his narrative uh, before whiteness studies was a thing. Uh, he recognized the impact that whiteness had on American racial history and recognizes that Mormons are being denigrated as not white enough in the 19th century, and that has an impact upon the way that the racial story plays out. Uh, so, I'm enthusiastic uh, that the book has been uh, re-released and it's uh, welcome uh, to hopefully reach a new audience in the 21st century and great timing, uh, the 40th year anniversary of the lifting of the priesthood restriction. So all of those things combine, I think, to uh, lead me to congratulate Noel on the reissue of his book. Thank you. Once again, um, wonderful uh, presentation by three very knowledgeable and able uh, authors and commentators. <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind now, um, just put up your chair and clear the... No What's that? Question no answer? Question answer. Oh, brother. Yeah, question answer. That's you know one. what? I am so sorry because not only did I turn 65 not too long ago, but I have a cold and I'm not thinking very... It's great tonight. I apologize for that. Um, I just thought, well, it's quarter after seven, and we'll we'll just end it. But no, we're not going to do that. So please uh, ask your questions, and we'll um, we will. Uh, you want to just field those, and then if they want to sure. ask yeah. the yeah. others, yeah. I guess you can direct your questions to any of the three of us that you have questions, or all of us. Uh, what what questions or comments or complaints do you have? <laughs> I'll start with a complaint. <laughs> Actually, no, a, qu a question. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, Brigham Young's uh, notions of slavery and how that might tie into his notions of an ancient Israelite society and servanthood? There seems to be a connection. Uh, yes, I, 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 you know, Paul mentioned uh, the uh, fact that. Uh, that uh, to some extent, uh, the way that the act in relation to service was written discouraged slavery, but there's actually more to the story than that because, uh, you know, uh, Brigham Young's attitudes towards slavery were complex because, I mean, you can't escape the fact that the act in relation to service legalized slavery in Utah. Utah was the only Western territory that legalized slavery. And uh, while the measure was in part, uh, you know, the way it was written was to discourage large-scale slaveholding, it was also designed to uh, allow slavery for those slaves that were there. And that was, was an issue that uh, was very strong at that time because uh, when they arrived in Utah, uh, the uh, Latter-day Saints confronted uh, more blacks, uh, more black slaves than they'd ever confronted up to that time. So it clearly legalized the holding of black slaves and, uh, and, and, and so it was a slavery measure and it was in force. There, was, there were blacks in Utah that were held as, as black slaves and uh, it wasn't abolished until 1862 when slavery was abolished in all of the western territories. And, the other thing that I emphasize is that black priesthood denial was intertwined with uh, Brigham Young calling for the legalization of slavery in Utah. If you read uh, uh, the uh, speech that he gave as territorial governor to the Utah 
uh, territorial legislature, he, uh, he proclaims that both black slavery and black priesthood denial are divinely sanctioned institutions. So they're intertwined, and that's a theme that I, I, I emphasize when I talk about, uh, when I talk about uh, slavery. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, the, the LDS attitude, Mormon attitudes towards slavery, have a complex history in and of themselves because if you read carefully the Book of Mormon, you know, that, that, that is the first uh, indication of, 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 uh, of a Mormon attitude towards slavery is that it, it, slavery, human bondage, is condemned in the Book of Mormon. That's the first phase it goes through. And then it goes into a, a, a second phase in the early 1830s where the Latter-day Saints uh, try to disassociate themselves completely from the slave controversy. And I bring this out very strongly in, in my book. That's the second phase. The third phase is what I call the anti-slavery, pro-slavery phase in the mid-1830s when Joseph Smith and other church leaders are compelled to speak out in favor of slavery and against the burgeoning uh, abolitionist movement. It's kind of a combination of being pro-slavery and being, uh, being anti-abolitionist. And that's when the earliest statements affirming that, that, that slavery is divinely sanctioned, although it was not, you know, I reject the, the Missouri thesis, it wasn't used as a justification for black priesthood denial in the 1830s. It wasn't until Brigham Young picks up on it in the 1850s that he reverts to the earlier arguments of Joseph Smith. And then probably the, the, the phase that, the, that uh, is more highly publicized by, uh, in, in, in the uh, official Gospel Topics uh, essay on, 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 on race and slavery is when Joseph Smith in the 1840s assumes an anti-slavery position. And that becomes an essential point in his 1844 uh, uh, platform when he's running for president of the United States. He's growing, calling for the gradual uh, emancipation of blacks and uh, doing away with slavery. And, and other uh, church spokesmen, church leaders in the 1840s, you know, assume that same position. But then following Joseph Smith's death, and the migration, so that, yeah, that's the fourth phase. And then the fifth phase comes in the 1850s, and that's when uh, Brigham Young assumes a pro-slavery position. Uh, while he may be discouraging long, uh, large-scale slaveholding, you, you know, the act does legalize black slavery. And, 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 I, and, and I, as I say, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, the imposition of black slavery, because the earliest statements that we've been able to come up with, and Paul has confirmed this in his book and other studies, although if you read Max Mueller's most recent book, he's even try, he's, he's actually trying to push the date back a little bit. I, I just have been in the process of reading that book. He suggests that uh, John Gunnison, who visited Utah in his, uh, in his book on, on Utah, uh, uh, that was published in 1852, he's suggesting maybe the date could be even pushed back before 18. Are you familiar with that? That he he gives that in a footnote, and I think I think that deserves further attention because the date when black priesthood denial was actually put into force is still unclear, but the first public statements are are are, are not made until 1852, and it's in conjunction with his call for the legalization of of black slavery. So I see the two as intimately intertwined. Would you have any further comment on that, Paul? Um, well, so I would just, I disagree with Newell in terms of what the legislature produced, um, but that's okay. Um, we, can, we can disagree. Um, Brigham Young, in my estimation, is striking a middle ground between chattel slavery as practiced in the South and uh, full emancipation uh, as advocated by some radical abolitionists. He certainly does not believe black people are equal to white people. Uh, but he doesn't believe uh, that what the legislature is passing is chattel slavery as practiced in the South. There is a legal middle ground in the 19th century. We like to only think in terms of free or slave in the 21st century. There were a whole spectrum of unfree labor categories in the 19th century. And we will uh, situate what Utah passes within that spectrum of unfree labor conditions in the 19th century. 
sense. Having said that, we will also say that for uh, the black slaves, they don't wake up the next day and say, uh, my life is somehow marketably different because now I've been defined as a servant rather than a slave. But it is a legally distinct category in the 19th century, and we believe that's what the legislature was uh, passing. And we'll lay out the, the full parameters of that, but compare it to other gradual emancipation codes passed by northern states in the 19th century versus chattel slavery laws passed by southern states in the 19th century. But the Act of 52 uh, didn't uh, provide for gradual emancipation. It, it, was, it was slavery in perpetuity. I mean, I, you know, uh, from the way I read the Act, I guess maybe unless you come up with some other documents, and in fact, when the state, when the territorial legislature passed the first Act, they, they called it, uh, they used the word slavery directly because they, they felt they were passing a law to legalize black slavery in Utah, and Brigham Young comes back and says, I don't like the way that this, uh, this law is, is titled. I, uh, they, they, he wanted to soften the language, an act in relation to service, being a servant, doesn't sound as severe as being called a slave, even though they were they were held in perpetuity as black slaves. But I guess we can go back and forth. You 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 know I, I'll be anxious to see what kind of new documentation. I think it's an area, and I, I applaud you and other scholars for you know carefully examining that very ambiguous period. Uh, you know from from the time that they arrive in Utah and. Uh, it would be interesting to see see what Gunnison observed. I don't know if there's anything in his papers, if he has papers available. It would be interesting to see what what uh, Gunnison had, had, had uh, recalled Brigham Young saying, and, and if, that's, if that's more more contemporary documentation on that. Because I, I found that one of the more striking things in going through Max Mueller's book. So I, I deal with Gunnison in my book, and uh, he is obviously getting as a source information. His book is published in 1852, but he couldn't have gotten his information from the territorial legislature. Yeah. Therefore, his information comes before 52. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so sometime between 49 and 52, he becomes aware of a restrictive, restrictive policy. policy for priesthood ordination because he articulates it in his book. I trace when the publication takes place, the letters that are going back between he and Albert Carrington, so the timing of it couldn't have come as a result of him learning from the territorial legislature. Yeah. Uh, but still leaves it open to question in terms of, you know, the exact date when he might have learned of that from Albert Carrington. Yeah, and 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 but it, it apparently wasn't made public uh, before '52. I, I I guess that's the critical thing. And and uh, uh, was uh, you know how much of a catalyst was uh, the '52. Uh, act in relation to service uh, for this, you know, for the public announcement. You know, I, I, I think the two are clearly intertwined. But as far as the, the policy or, or, or practice being established, uh, that, that I, it, it'd be interesting to see if we, if we go back to an 1849 date, which was a, what Lester Bush initially argued in his uh, seminal dialogue article, and which I erroneously allowed to be put in my book because it was the incomplete Wilford Woodruff uh, diary entry. Other questions? Yes? So after Polygamy was discontinued, there were a number of leadership in the hierarchy that hung on to it. Um, and Kennedy was appointed to the Are, are you speaking of, 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 of when the ban was perpetuated after no, the abolition of slavery? After 1978. After 78. I mean, was there people within people with, in that had problems with the lifting of the ban? Had a hard time letting go of that the way there were Well, people. it was remarkably, there was remarkably little uh, opposition or pushback. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, mainline Latter-day Saints didn't have any problems at all. But what's kind of curious is uh, is that fundamentalist Mormons. I, I've done some study on that. That uh, that uh, people that were you know polygamists practicing polygamists, 
they, they, they latched onto that immediately and, and said this was another indication that the mainline LDS church was going into apostasy. In fact, somebody from the uh, All Red Group, from the AUB, took out a full-page ad in, 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 I think it was the Salt Lake Tribune, and they were denouncing the fact that the, that the church had lifted the ban. They didn't put down that they were representing the AUB. It was kind of a fictitious name, but it, 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 uh, it was clearly from the All Red group. And other uh, fundamentalist groups uh, followed the same line of reasoning, say, hey, this, uh, this along with the Manifesto of 1890 is one more indication that the mainline Latter-day Saints are in apostasy. But they were the only ones that really were speaking out uh, against the pushing back against the, the lifting of the ban as, as far as, you know, and following what was happening. I think most Latter-day Saints were overjoyed at the fact that this embarrassing, odious practice had at long last been lifted. I, I think it was a sigh of relief. Every, I think every Latter-day Saint who, you know, remembers that time because you remembered it was it was it was a, a day of euphoria. It was a lay, day of relief. Uh, I, 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 for me, it was. I, I was very surprised because I said, uh, in in studying it closely, I, I I thought it was pretty well entrenched, and uh, I had to do a lot of rethinking on my on, on my part uh, when I revised the dissertation into a book. Other questions? Yes, back there, uh, Gary. So this is a question for you, but it also might affect Paul a little bit. Um, and without me to put Paul on the spot, um, <laughs> thanks to uh, Rick Bennett's interview with, uh, with Paul and Paul's willingness to talk about it, we know that Paul <coughs> was involved to some extent in the church's essay, Gospel Topics essay on race and the priesthood. So I'm wondering, Noah, what's your opinion of that essay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're putting me on the spot, aren't you? Uh, well, I, uh, let me uh, say on the positive side, I really appreciated the fact that the church was willing to acknowledge that, the, that number one, the practice began with uh, Brigham Young, because that was long overdue, and that they refuted what they called the uh, racist folklore, uh, as they termed it, which was used to justify the ban. And I, I, so I, 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 I applaud uh, the, uh, the, the Gospel Topics uh, essay for going that far. But I, I feel there was a sense of incompleteness because it really didn't uh, address why the ban was established in the first place. And I think that's a critical issue that I, I, I tackle in my book. I, I try to tackle it forthright and what I feel is, is honest in, in, in an honest way. Uh, not everybody would agree with that. I know Paul disagrees with uh, certain aspects of my uh, analysis in that regard. But I, you know, I feel that, that the church didn't go far enough in uh, uh, you know in, in in discussing why the ban was established in the first place, and uh, I, I I think that was one of the uh, one of the great weaknesses, and that acknowledge and and, and failing to acknowledge uh, the impact of slavery on the uh, beginnings of the ban. I would say those were two uh, aspects that were. Uh, were not sufficiently addressed in uh, the Gospel Topics essay itself. Uh, in fact, I, I should mention that Matt Harris has written an extensive essay that's going to be included in a volume that uh, uh, we have co-edited on all of the Gospel Topics essays. I, I, I should mention that I really applaud the LDS Church for their willingness to address not only the race and priesthood issue, but address other very difficult, complex, doctrinal, historical issues, 13 in all. And uh, I, I, I feel that the church, LDS church, has come a long ways in going down that road. But there's still a ways to go in acknowledging all of the uh, reasons why uh, that, in particular, the, 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 the black 
uh, priesthood, uh, the, the, the race and priesthood uh, issue uh, could, go, could have gone further. You have a comment, Paul? <laughs> uh, my only comment is I have never claimed responsibility for that essay. <laughs> I did not write it. Um, so I just want to make sure that's on the record. Okay. And I didn't claim that for Rick Bennett's interview. Um, I've never claimed that I have written it. Um, so I take no responsibility. Did you contribute to it? I did. And I, <laughs> I have claimed that. <laughs> but um, I had no oversight at all for what was published online. And you can understand the power dynamics at play. They would not give a professor from the University of Utah any oversight for something they put up at LDS.org. And was more was were some of those issues covered in the fuller essay that never got published? Like <laughs> weren't there fifty five page essays submitted for most of these or all of these? Would would that have included so I can only speak to the one that I, you know. I worked on. So 55-page uh, essay, um, which obviously was in more depth than what you get in however many pages is online, right? So if uh, part of the problem is, um, you know, it doesn't address this question or that question in depth, well, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, Paul, I, I, that, that kind of raises a question in my mind. Do you think the church in the future might uh, might uh, reveal uh, uh, you know might move more in the direction of the 55 page original draft where you touch on these issues that uh, that that didn't make it into the final essay do you think the church might eventually move down that road and acknowledge some of those things no I don't um, <laughs> I don't I don't see that happening they maintain control of the longer <coughs> essays um, and I don't see anything happening with them. Mm. Hey, okay, this will have to be the last one. Have you been able to uh, discern in your uh, research uh, what N. Eldon Tanner's views on race uh, were? Was was he like the uh, the hardcore segregationist type, like Joseph Fielding Smith and not, Mark Peterson not really. and Isaac Benson? Or was he more like his relative, U.B. Brown, more of an enlightened... Uh, I had more enlightened views on uh, on rights. Well, that's a that's a good question, and I I can't answer it because he, I haven't he really didn't seen have any, much to say. He didn't about really it. have much to say. He he signed that statement by yeah, virtue of being the first but president. Hubie Brown signed it too. Yeah, I mean Hubie Brown, as I say, he was uh, sort of like the Godfather. They made him an offer he couldn't refuse, and you know he was compelled to sign it. I mean it's it's sort of a sad story because. According to the reminiscences of, of, of Ed Firmage, his, uh, his, I guess his grandson or his, uh, his relative, uh, that he was on, on the verge of tears having to affix his name to this document. He just, he was almost and, sobbing. And died a bitter man. After. Yeah, he was, not, he was not a happy camper when he died. He, he, I mean, it's, uh, 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 Matt Harris is actually, I, I, can, I can sort of plug, uh, Matt Harris is in the process of working on a full, uh, scale biography on Hubie Brown, which is going to be uh, published by, uh, by Signature Books. He's, he's under contract working on a, f which will be, a, I think, a fascinating uh, insight into <coughs> the life and the times of Hubie Brown. He, in, in a lot of ways, he was an outliner, you know, in, 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 in terms of where the church was. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's interesting because one of the other uh, uh, one of the other people that actually spoke out had, had great skepticism about the black priesthood ban as early as 1940 was was J. Reuben Clark. J., uh, you know, this is pointed out in, in Mike Quinn's uh, excellent biography on, 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 uh, on J. J. Reuben Clark. And then in the, in the 1950s, you know, because da David O. McKay, he was extremely bothered by the black priesthood ban. I, I mean, I, 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 I gave a simplified picture of where David O. McKay was, but... Well, I, well he I, was bothered by it in the 1920s. The yeah. early 1920s. Well, you know, he made this world tour and he could see the direction in which the church was going to yeah. be an international church. And uh, so, you know, very much like, uh, uh, like Spencer W. Kimball. I mean, uh, 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 Apostle Kimball, as an apostle, he was extremely... Uh, bothered by the ban. I, I think one of the what-ifs in, in history that's kind of tantalizing to me is, uh, uh, number one, what if uh, 
they'd been able to move toward abolishing the ban, because there was a, an extensive study that was undertaken in the mid-1950s uh, by Benyon, by Adam S. Benyon, the so-called Benyon investigation, to try to tease out where the roots of the band were, and it'd be wonderful if, you, if those, <laughs> those, those materials, uh, you know, the Benyon uh, analysis and, and, and that, what, the, what, what they were coming up with, because he, he and, and, and Hubie Brown were, were, were two of the people that were uh, really seriously, because uh, I think Hubie Brown was ordained an apostle, I think in the mid to late, 1950s, and uh, so immediately he 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 could see that uh, that this was going to be an increasingly problematic issue for the church. As did President McKay. From the time he became church president in 1951, he uh, he made that trip to Africa, and he could see, and then he made a trip to Latin America, and he could see the potential problems that were developing at that time. Okay. I guess that's it. That's it. <laughs> well, I don't want any of you to be embarrassed that you were ready to put up your chairs before the Q&A. <laughs> I'm sorry. Presented a, 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 a sort of a shift on the part of the church. It declared that the churches, it declared the church's full support for full civil rights for black people, stating that it is a moral evil for any person or group of persons to deny any human being the right to gainful employment, to full education opportunity, and to every privilege of fellowship. So this shows that the church had, had come some distance and, 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 and was shifting on the issue of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of civil rights. Brown, uh, President Brown, however, was much, much less successful in bringing an end to the deeply entrenched uh, black priesthood and temple ban. Despite his untiring efforts to end, uh, end the odious practice one and, once and for all, a campaign that he un undertook throughout the 1960s, uh, the, the historic ban had commenced as a practice under Brigham Young beginning in 1852. It kind of went through a three-stage evolution. It starts out as a practice, and, uh, and, and that's what it is when it, uh, throughout most of the, re through the rest of the 19th century. And then, uh, then it, uh, it is hardened into an established policy by the early 20th century. But, and, and, and by the spring, by the, by the early 1950s, the bands legitimacy was further enhanced as doctrine. I use the word doctrine not lightly because thanks to a 1949 official first presidency declaration, this statement, and it was a definitive turning point because as I say, the statement uh, in 1949 was signed by then President George Albert Smith and his two counselors, J. Reuben Clark and David O. McKay. And it, uh, it, it proclaimed the following, the black priesthood denial was a direct command from the Lord, founded on the doctrine, I use this word doctrine, this is their wording, of the church from the days of its organization. In justifying the ban, the statement <laughs> referred to the conduct of spirits in the premortal existence. Uh, alluding or suggesting the fact that certain spirits were less, uh, less valiant uh, in the war in heaven and therefore they were destined to, uh, ha uh, to inherit black bodies. Uh, that this had a determining effect in justifying the establishment of the ban. But it did, however, uh, proclaim or promise that the day would come when the black race will be redeemed and possess all of the blessings which we now have. But it added this caveat, but this would occur only after all the rest of the children of God have received their blessings in the Holy Priesthood. And making this latter statement of qualifying when this would happen, they were quoting directly what Brigham Young had said in the late 19th century. Thus, when President Brown undertook his crusade, history was clearly not on his side. Also, he faced the, ins uh, the seemingly insurmountable task 
of persuading, persuading a majority of the church ruling hierarchy to go along with him. Despite these obstacles, uh, Brown persisted in pushing ahead over the six-year period from 1963 through 1969. In 1963, Brown optimistically predicted that a change was imminent. Uh, was relating his optimism, optimism in an interview with a New York Times reporter, uh, uh, the uh, Times, uh, through, the pa through the pages of their newspaper, uh, uh, proclaimed, and I'm, here we go, I've got a page out of order here, we're okay, that the top leadership in the Mormon church is seriously considering the abandonment of its historic policy of discrimination against Negroes. As I say, this was 63, obviously, erroneously, and extremely premature. Well, as I say, Brown continued to push ahead. And in December 1969, December 1969, he, Brown publicly again proclaimed that the church was about to lift its ban on black priesthood ordination. Brown ba based his renewed optimism on the fact that he had secured support from a majority of the Quorum of the Twelve. According to one source, uh, a majority of the church's hierarchy agreed with Brown that the time had come to lift the ban. But absent from these proceedings, from this lobbying effort on the part of Brown, was President David O. McKay, who was extremely ill at that time. He was close to death by this time. Senior Apostle uh, uh, Harold B. Lee was, was conspicuously absent out of the country on church assignment, as was Alvin A. Dyer, a First Presidency Counselor. Uh, I, I, and and, and he, uh, th both Lee and Dyer were noted foes to the idea of lifting the ban. So, seizing the moment, Brown secured majority support uh, uh, for, you know, lifting the ban. However, when Lee and Dyer returned to Salt Lake City and discovered what Brown had da done, they were... Uh, especially Lee, he was just irate. He was absolutely angry uh, that, that this had been done, you know, behind his back. And he immediately lobbied on his own, able to convince a majority of those people that had supported Brown's lifting of the ban to keep the ban in place and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, to withdraw their support for, you know, lifting the ban. And then... <laughs> The, the, the upshot of all of this, Lee, Lee uh, drafted an alternative uh, statement which became known as the 1969 Declaration Upholding the Ban. And he compelled both Brown and uh, Tanner to sign this as a first presidency statement. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the Godfather, uh, kind of the thing from the Godfather. Either, either your, your signature or your brains are going to be on this uh, document. It has that kind of flavor. I mean, because uh, uh, Brown was, oh, he was almost beside himself that uh, all of a sudden he found that his crusade had crumbled right from under him and he was uh, compelled uh, to sign something that was, he was diametrically opposed. And so, the resulting 1969 First Presidency Statement reaffirmed black priesthood denial as a doctrine. The statement was dated the 15th of December, 1969, but it's curious to point out it was only signed by the two counselors in the First Presidency. David O. McKay was critically ill at the time and unable to sign it. In fact, he would die just one month later in mid January 19, uh, 1970. The statement itself proclaimed that the ban as doctrine is, quote, not something that originated with man, but goes back to the beginning with God, adding that blacks were not yet to receive the priesthood for reasons we believe are known to God, but which he has not made fully known to man. It further stated that God is discriminatory to those whom he grants the priesthood to, 
but promised. And it concludes with, it, 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 it states, but it promised, sometime in God's eternal plan, the Negro will be given the right to the priesthood. The statement also proclaimed the LDS's support, church's support for civil rights. The latter statement of supporting civil rights was something that Brown insisted on as a precondition for his signature to the document. Conspicuously absent from the document was any mention of a divine curse on blacks or anything linking blacks with a pre uh, with with pre uh, earth light misbehavior or other alleged transgressions points of document that had been affirmed or had been stated in the 1949 statement so anyway uh, that uh, kind of concludes uh, my presentation it kind of gives a, uh, in conclusion the uh, LDS's church uh, position on civil rights shifted from strong opposition to the 19, uh, during the 1940s and 1950s from strong opposition to uh, support by the early 1960s. By contrast, the church doubled down, reaffirmed its stand upholding its long-standing ban on black priesthood ordination and entry in the temple. And uh, it was, as I say, these two statements of 49 and 69 enshrined it as doctrine. And so that means that it would take a revelation to lift the ban, which finally came at the long promised day in 1978. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, I, I, I'm here to be shot at. <laughs> All right, let's. Okay, yeah, go ahead and, and uh, dewire you. Yeah, dewire me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Next victim. <laughs> Where's the honorary? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how you do first. No, I'm not taking no longer. Let him try out that bass voice without the. Anything but a bass voice. Can you hear me in the back? Good, good. Wow. I haven't seen New Orleans several years. Several years. Uh, my name is Ronald Coleman. And uh, let me give you a little background how, how I happen to be here this evening. Or not specifically this evening, but in, in Utah. It's something certain I never thought, I, a place I thought I would never be at this time in my life. I came to uh, my first uh, contact with what is Utah was when I was 10 years of age. My parents were on a return trip. We'd been to visit grandparents in Louisiana and in Illinois, and we were going back uh, home to San Francisco. And in most of the states where the train stopped, I'd pick, I'd pick up a rock and try to save them. I don't know what ever happened to them. And the thing that I remembered about Utah was this big body of water, which later I learned was the Great Salt Lake, and the train tracks went across. And that was it, 1954. Nine years later, I began, uh, I returned to Salt Lake City for, uh, what I thought would be two and a half years. Uh, I uh, w was recruited to uh, pl play football at the University of Utah. And it's certainly something that I didn't want to do, but uh, Thomas Coleman was a very strong-willed individual. <laughs> and so at 18 years of age, I transferred from City College of San Francisco to the University of Utah. And I was here from about February of 1963 until December of 1965, and I left never to return. And I was gone. Uh, I never envisioned making this uh, my home. And that 18 and a, that the two and a half years I was here was in the a pretty difficult time in race relations. I wasn't naive to 
problems with race relations, lived in San Francisco, I uh, certainly knew what was happening in various parts of time, and as much as I uh, liked the Neapolitan ice cream sandwiches, I dare not cross the picket line at Woolworths in, on Market <laughs> Street in uh, Powell in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I graduated from the university, and it was a wonderful experience. I got what I came for, which was my degree, and uh, left never to return. While I was here, I developed a certain sense of race consciousness that I had not experienced before. And that was primarily due to the fact that, as uh, Newell has indicated, this was uh, not a favorable place for African Americans to live. Population number one was very small. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the discrimination, which I really didn't experience as a student athlete, on the University of Utah campus. I lived on campus. The campus was pretty much my world. Uh, during the time I, I was an undergraduate student, I met Dr. Ch or Charles Neighbors, who was an anatomy professor. And it was Dr. Neighbors and his involvement with the civil rights movement in the NAACP, which compelled me and a number of my teammates to do something which we didn't consider to be our, our concern since we were uh, just temporarily uh, here. And uh, he called us out. And first time I ever went on a picket line was in Salt Lake City, at the NAACP. I don't know the exact year, but it was connected to the lack of access to employment opportunities, and most importantly, I came to believe, housing. And there was a general lack of visibility and, and inclusion for the, on the part of not just African Americans, but uh, Latinos uh, as, as well. And so you sort of felt an obligation to become involved in it. And uh, that's what began my a sense of consciousness. I uh, left, I came back in 1972. I was uh, by then uh, working uh, on a master's degree and teaching at Sacramento City College. And my advisor, uh, when I was looking for an MA thesis project, had raised the possibility of doing a, uh, a looking at race and the Latter day Saint and the priesthood issue. I told him that that had been done, and uh, I didn't see where there was going to be much to be gained. But he said, but not from a black perspective. And uh, I said, well, and that was what be began my return to Salt Lake City, Utah. I renewed an acquaintance with a former professor uh, by the name of Dr. Philip C. Sturgis. Pops was my that's I refer to him affectionately as Pops, uh, because he was a, a jazz aficionado. He loved the early jazz, Armstrong, Joe King Oliver, I mean, that was his thing. And he approached me about the possibilities of uh, pursuing doctoral studies. And I told him that uh, I didn't think I was interested. I had responsibilities in California. I couldn't see returning to Salt Lake. And I talked to my advisor when they invited me to come to campus. He says, go up and hear what they have to say. You don't know what what it, what, what, what will come out of it. And so I returned in the fall of 72, interviewed, and when Dr. Sturgis first uh, approached me about an offer, Paul, oh, you'll get a kick out of this. He, he offered me a TA position, teaching assistant position. And he, I said, well, what is that? What's the compensation? He told me $300 a month in a tuition waiver. <laughs> and I remembered saying, my, my child support is $300 a month. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went home. You know, it was a nice trip. Saw a ball game. I thought that was the end of it. And he made me an offer. You mentioned Don Corleone. 
<laughs> that I could not refuse. <laughs> he brought me back here at an at a instructor's position. The only deal was I had to go to work on a PhD and teach full time at the same time. And uh, he uh, just changed the whole direction of my life. And it was easier coming back because people, I knew some people here, and uh, Salt Lake had started to change by 1973. And it's changed a great deal. This is a wonderful place. Uh, I'll be here the rest of my life, and when I'm gone, I'll be out. I think she's going to put me out on 106th South somewhere. <laughs> 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 so that's how I came to be here. It's been uh, almost 45 years. Uh, I don't try to speak off the top because I messed up. So I prepared these remarks. First of all, I'm surprised that I'm here because when the Kurt and the staff first approached me, I said, I'm done, I'm retired. <laughs> uh, but they're so nice to you. They make you feel comfortable every time you come here. Uh, the prices are reasonable for the most part. <laughs> and uh, I, I couldn't say no. Uh, and plus, a very good friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Darius Gray, is very close to uh, this, this, this the place. And, and I said, I had to say yes. So here I am. Uh, and uh, I want my neighbor who to know that I do work, I did work, <laughs> so when I'm asleep in the morning, try not to make so much noise when you're uh. <laughs> uh, This event, as you know, comes at a, a very special time as uh, we're approaching the 40th anniversary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, 1978 pronouncement regarding blacks and the priesthood. That, uh, and 37 years ago, as you know, Professor Newell Bringhurst published Saints, Slaves, and Blacks, The Changing Place of Black People Within Mormonism. Uh, I've known Newell a number of years, and, uh, decades, mm -hmm. and he was at the University of California, Davis, uh, and I was in Sacramento. Uh, this book, along with the writings of Stephen Taggart, whom I think is a sort of a forgotten uh, scholar in this field. I mean, I met Stephen, the late Stephen Taggart. He had passed away when I came to Salt Lake in 1972 to do some research. I met his, 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 his wife, his widow, and she gave me a, a, a lot of materials that, uh, and that really saved me a lot of time, and she was very, very helpful. And sort of because of, of the quality of the work that has come in succeeding decades, I think that sometimes Mr. Taggart didn't, didn't, doesn't get his due. But he's a ma he was a major person, uh, and uh, I'm eternally grateful to his wife for, for providing me with those materials. But it was Stephen Taggart, Armand Miles, and, and Lester Bush particularly Lester Bush, who influenced a great increase in interest in race, religions, and communities in Utah. They're the, they're the pioneers. Not only did it impact on our studies of race, religion, and communities in Utah history, but also in the national and international spheres as well. Examples would include Jesse Embry's Black Saints in a White Church, Darius Gray and Margaret Young's trilogy, Standing on the Promises. More recently, Max Mueller's Race and the Making of the Mormon People, and Russell Stevens' For the Cause of Righteousness, A Global History of Blacks and Mormonism, 1820, 1830 to 2013. All of these works have expanded our perspectives on black people and the Latter-day Saint Church. I would be remiss if I did not mention the outstanding work of one of our panelists this evening, Professor W. Paul Reed Walter.
<laughs> Paul has been a colleague and a friend since he joined the University of Utah's Department of History. I highly recommend, if you do not already have it in your library, Religion of a Different Color, Race, and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness. And uh, Paul was always available to chop shop for me and explore ideas. And this was particularly critical in that in the years after his mentor had died, had an untimely death, the late Professor Dean May, there was a void. And then when he came, it filled right back up. I appreciate that, Paul. Uh, I would have one more plug, and then I'll sit down. There is a, to show you the, the importance and relevance of Latter-day Latter -day Saints history, there is a online website that is the, undoubtedly the best in the world when it comes to African and African American history. And it's called blackpast.org. And uh, I'm, this plug is done because I, this is an important website. And my, it's, the, it's the child of my friends. This, this means more to him, I think, than his children mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, it, it was put, organized and put together by Professor Quintard Taylor at the University of, 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 of Washington. And uh, about, one, two, three, about three, three to four years ago, he said, you know, I want to add uh, something to the website pertaining to uh, the history of blacks in the Mormon church, blacks in the Mormon church. And he, I think he was visiting, he'd given a talk here in Salt Lake, uh, and uh, he said, I need you to write an essay. Uh, no. Uh, but I did get mine out early, and fortunately, he, when he says now, when he comes, I can say no and not feel guilty. Uh, but this is an extraordinary website. And about 34 years ago, he said, we need to add a new section to it, upgrade. And so he met Darius Gray and Margaret Young and others, uh, and there now is a Latter-day Saints or Search of Jesus Christ tag in African American or Black History on that website, blackpass.org. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it, and if you're interested in writing for it, when you're in this subject, uh, it's no pay, but good play. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Everyone hear me okay? Uh, well, so thanks to Kurt and, um, of course, Newell and Ron. It's a pleasure to be with two people that I look up to and uh, whose, whose shoulders I'm fortunate enough to try to uh, stand on. And, um, you know, when Ron was talking, I thought of, uh, <clears throat> and talking sort of more personal experience, um, I remembered when I arrived at the University of Utah, uh, Ron has always been a good friend of mine, but uh, the, my first year at the University of Utah, he came into my office and both of us shared something in common. We both received our terminal degrees from the University of Utah and then ended up, then ended up working at the place where we received our terminal degrees. Now, through different circumstances, uh, we came back to the place where we got our PhDs and uh, sometimes in academia, you have people who get your degrees uh, from more prestigious places than you, the University of Utah. And Ron sat me down. He probably doesn't remember this. <laughs> I will never forget this uh, because it made a difference to me. And sometimes uh, 
we forget when we do nice things for other people, but uh, I certainly haven't forgotten. And he said, uh, you are not less than anyone else because you received your PhD at the University of Utah. Hold your head high. You belong in this department and we're happy to have you here. And he has been a profound mentor to me ever since and I will always remember that and appreciate his friendship. Um, so what I wanted to do is just uh, talk about where I situate uh, Noel's work and why I'm uh, happy that it's been re-released um, and, and situated within this bigger historiography and I think Ron did some of that. Um, so historiography is a fancy academic term for the history of how we write this history. Uh, so one of the important contributions I think um, Newell makes in his book is simply uh, establishing the racial universalism that was at play in the first couple of decades of Mormonism. And why is that important? Uh, I think that's important because it undermined the standing narrative. So the internal story as it was understood and told internally within Mormonism was simply that the racial priesthood and temple restrictions were in place from the beginning. They had always been there. God had put them in place. Man can't do anything about it, and it will take a revelation to get rid of. And you have, as Ron mentioned, Stephen Taggart uh, articulating what comes to be called the Missouri Thesis, suggesting that no, it wasn't there from the beginning, that in fact there were historical forces at play in uh, the, the Mormons very fraught and troubled passage through Missouri. Uh, and then Lester Bush comes along and suggests uh, we can even date it uh, later than that with Brigham Young, not Missouri, uh, Brigham Young in Utah Territory and, and not Joseph Smith. Um, and so you have Newell that comes along and he also then helps to undermine that internal narrative by establishing this notion of racial universalism that uh, the Mormon message was perceived and understood as universal for all people in the beginning decades. And that is a pushback. It's a rejection of the notion that the priesthood and temple restrictions were in place from the beginning. And that's an important contribution in terms of understanding uh, how this history plays out. He also then um, undermines any notion of a cohesive racial understanding how the Mormons understood uh, very hot, percolating political topics in the 19th century, such as slavery. And he establishes the notion that they are responding to events on the ground. That uh, Joseph Smith is making statements in the 1830s, and then he transitions to statements in the 1840s, right? And you see change over time, which is really important to historians, and certainly wasn't a part of the inside narrative. And so, once again, he's undermining uh, that inside narrative and helping us to think about it in a more complicated way. Um, and then the other uh, contribution that I see Newell making is uh, having to do with the chapter on slavery in, 18, in the 1850s in Utah Territory. The Territorial Legislature passes uh, a servant code in 1852. And uh, Newell, in his narrative, believes it when, believes actually Brigham Young when he tells Horace Greeley in 1859 that Utah would be a free state. And some people have suggested that uh, Brigham Young is just speaking to a national audience and not really what he means. And um, what we have in Newell's book is uh, that he believes this. Um, and Newell argues that the 1852 territorial law that the legislature passed was designed to, quote, discourage any large-scale slaveholding in Utah. And I'm not sure that that's received a lot of attention, Newell, but that's the claim that you make, and uh, I think it's really uh, a fascinating claim. I am in the process of working on a, a book, a documentary history of the 1852 territorial legislature, and I think that claim actually holds up um, with the documentary history that we're working on and the context that we're trying to uh, create uh, for what the legislators are responding to. Um, so Newell says the law was designed to discourage any large-scale slaveholding in Utah. All the provisions of that law were...